Hey, this is Bill Hamm from Real Estate Raw. If you want to learn how to use your small axe to build an empire, you should be listening to the Small Axe with my good friend, Nico Salgado. Hey guys, it's your boy Nico here from the Small Axe Podcast. I want to show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. You see, not everybody begins their investing career with millions of dollars, a huge network of investors, or the knowledge necessary to become successful in this space. And that's okay. What I focus on here on this podcast is helping you hone your skills, sharpen your tools to become the best investor that you can be. Now, I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this show. If you have any questions or you want to reach out to me or the guest, feel free to do so. Love you guys. All right, Small Axe community, welcome back to another episode. I am so excited. I got the Bill Ham on with me for the second time. This should be, honestly, Bill, this should be monthly. I know you're a super busy guy, but for my value and my listeners' value, I would love to have you on monthly, but I, maybe I one day. <laughs> maybe one day, right. <laughs> so let's do this. Uh, people should know who you are, but they might not. So let's kind of give them some sort of background of who you are, where you came from, how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. Um, yep. So I have been in the multifamily space as an owner operator for the last 20 years uh, or 19 years, I guess. Um, I got in early 2005. I was a, a pilot by trade, flew airplanes for a living. And my very first deal was a duplex. And I, I had $10,000 saved up and thought I'm a genius. So I'm going to go into real estate full time with a duplex and 10 grand. Turned out it turned out to be a good idea, but then maybe not such a great idea and like in the short run. But yeah, uh, so yeah, that was that was a hell of a road. And I've uh, been here for 20 years after that. Um, made a lot of money, lost some money, had some a lot of successes, had some failures. And I now teach, um, you know, educate other people in getting into the business uh, with, with the experience. So that's in a nutshell. That's pretty much me. <laughs> All right, cool. So let me take it from there. So you uh, were originally where and where are you now? Originally, um, I started my career in, in multifamily um, in Macon, Georgia. So that was uh, in, in, like I said, uh, 2005, early 2005. And I spent um, some years in middle Georgia, Macon, Georgia area, building up the portfolio, did several hundred units down there, and then started branching off up into Atlanta and surrounding markets. So I built a lot of my portfolio between uh, Macon and Atlanta and sort of that northern Georgia, middle Georgia type market. Um, I am based out of Atlanta, but I have actually moved physically to Clearwater, Florida. So I live in Florida, but business is still hub out of Atlanta. And okay, I'm going to, I'm going to paint this a little bit for everybody. So the, the majority of your first deals that you picked up were not done the traditional way. Can you kind of expand a little bit on that? That's right. So, um, yeah, my first 402 units I did with creative financing, uh, and that was meaning I closed the property or took possession of the property in some manner using some form of creative financing other than going down to a bank, putting down a, an amount and getting a traditional loan. Um, I was using seller financing, lease options, partnerships, different types of, of creative ways of getting into these deals. What I was doing was I was coming in that uh, post sort of 08, uh, you know, recession there and through that period, uh, buying up uh, and collecting real estate using creative financing techniques, I would stabilize them and then take them back over to the bank once I had them stabilized, right? So I was taking very distressed, unfinanceable property, getting in there, bringing sweat equity, a little bit of money, mostly sweat equity, turn that property around, get it where the bank wants to see it. Okay, now I'm refinancing at the bank and I'm paying off uh, the seller or however I got into the deal to begin with. You wrote a book about that, huh? I did. As a matter of fact, you know, I didn't think you would ask anything about that. So I just happened to bring it up. It's called Creative Cash. Never would have thought you'd ask. No, no I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I actually have written two books. Uh, one is called Creative Cash. And uh, that is the uh, first four to five, six years of my business, Creative Cash there. And that's teaching you how to use techniques like seller financing, creative financing, lease options, um, you know, partnerships, all that sort of stuff. And then my second book is Real Estate Raw. It's the same as the, the logo here, Real Estate Raw. Um, both are available on Amazon. And Real Estate Raw is the step-by-step -step how to build a portfolio in general. So I would I would recommend people, if you're going to read my book, start with Real Estate Raw. It's the how to get into multifamily, how to build multifamily. 
And then the creative financing book is how to use creative uh, financing for multifamily. So if you have both of them together, you've got a pretty solid base for, uh, for the business. Yeah. Really wonderful books, Bill. Um, they really helped me out and I, I tend to I, I tune back into them and you did the uh, audio uh, did. really good. That's correct. Really good job there too. Cause I'm an audio kind of guy. Cause I'm always doing something, either driving, running and listening to audio books. And I really appreciate those books. Appreciate it. How could people get them in? Uh, Amazon. Yep. Yeah, they're both on Amazon. That's it. They're, they're right there on Amazon. Um, and, and the one is in uh, Kindle and uh, or actually both are in Kindle. And then one is in auto, the creative cash is in all. So you can get them in all, all three formats. Cool. Bill, back to your uh, creative financing technique where you, I mean, you had little money, but what kind of equity did you get in these deals? Did you have to bring on a KP? What did you have to bring partners in to get well, those deals done? Yeah. Good question. No, the earlier ones, no. <clears throat> so the first uh, 400 units or so, um, well, let me see, let me back up the first 300 ish units, 250 or so units. Um, no, those were, there were no partners in those. Those were all just me um doing creative financing in some sort of manner you know i would get 100 percent financing from a seller sometimes or i would uh use a line of credit or pay cash whatever the case so to the first 200 and some odd there were no uh partners in there but me the last 150 was actually a combination and then from there on i syndicated so the, the last 152 units um, I did get seller financing on that property, but I, it was a $4 million seller financing uh, deal, but I did have to bring almost a million dollars to the seller in down payment money that I syndicated. So the very last deal was a combo seller financing, but I did go out and bring on a partner. We did raise the 800 and some odd thousand that we gave the seller. So that was a combo syndication seller financing. And then from that point on, all of the deals that I've done, um, have, some of them have had some small component of a seller carry back, something like that. But um, almost all the, the deals that I've done since then, the ones I do today, are uh, traditionally syndicated deals, normal general partner, limited partner structure. Uh, but I think that's about a change. And, and that's why I kind of brought that book out, Creative Cash, because I actually created those techniques back in 2012. And actually, we're using all those techniques back in uh, you know, the 08, post 08, 10, 11, 12, 13 window, as the real estate market started to get much better, 13, 14 on up through, you know, last year, last year and a half or so, uh, there's really not been any kind of creative financing and people really haven't used these techniques because the market's been so hot. Now that's about to change. Now that the rates are up and we're seeing some distress in the market. Uh, one of the hallmarks of, of a market shift like we're seeing right now and like we saw in 08 is a lack of lending. Right. So that's where the lenders really start to retreat. They stop lending as readily. In this case, rates went up plus balance sheet issues and different things we've seen in the market. So a lot of lenders aren't aren't lending as readily. And uh, that's where the creative financing comes in, especially when you have assets that are are, are not as easy to fund as, uh, you know, some some are nice, good, stabilized property. You'll get a loan. The stressed asset going to be tough. <laughs> that's finance. right. That's right. Okay. I'm going to back up a little bit more and stay with this for a few more minutes. So a lot of my listeners are going to be very excited to hear that, wait a minute, we can kind of get into a deal with little to no money, but how would some, why would somebody, why would a seller believe in you, Bill? Well, that's, uh, you know, I'll answer that question in two ways. Why would they believe in me personally? Why would they believe in your listener? Because, you know, I have 20 years experience. I've been here a long time. I have a resume. So that's why they would believe in me. But I don't want your listener to think, well, gosh, I haven't been here 20 years. Therefore, they're not going to listen to me. And that's not true. Um, you know, people do these kinds of deals all the time. So if you're new to the business, if you're getting into the business, uh, first, first tip is just really analyze the deals. Just bring deals in the door. Analyze them as if you were going to use a bank loan. And if you're not going to use a bank loan or the numbers don't work, then reach for some form of creative financing and make that sort of offer. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, that's that's the key. The, the, the reason why someone would listen to you is because you're making an offer that solves a problem. And that's the trick to using creative financing. And that's one of the absolute things that I teach in Creative Cash in any of my programs is how to, you know, make... Uh, or create value with that offer. If that offer is only valuable to you, then it's a lot less likely to get accepted. So when we're talking creative financing, that's incredibly important. The offer has to really solve a seller problem, which means you as the buyer have to identify the seller's problem to begin with. If the seller doesn't have a problem, well, then creative financing may not be 
on the table because again that may only solve your needs of maybe not having experience or not having money right so it can't be all one-sided so you got to look for sellers that are stressed what's wrong with them what do they need can i make an offer that helps them solves their problem that's how i was getting into deals without money back in the beginning and that's how you're going to do it again here going into the next cycle the majority of the deals that i'm seeing coming online recently where i am looking in tampa uh well, no, I don't want to say the majority, but it's a lot of them, what's happening is there are loans coming due and they need to sell um, or they're facing issues with the bank and the bank doesn't want to extend their their loan term. And these were bridge products and and values have gone down significantly and rates have gone up. Um, so, and, and but these people have loans on the property. So what kind of, is there a, an option? What kind of creative financing is is available for something like that? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not an option. And and that's one thing that people have to understand is creative financing is a tool. It is not the only tool, right? It, it does not solve all problems. There are deals that um, you shouldn't close. There are deals that are just not good deals and creative financing is not going to solve that. Um, that is, is one sort of conversation. That usually means something that's highly distressed or maybe in a neighborhood it just is not going to allow you to operate that property due to crime and demographics. All right. That being said, specific to your situation you're describing, yes, I, I one, I know we've had some foreclosures in the market. Two, I think we are going to have a lot more foreclosures in the near future, extending over the next year or so. So um, we we have had a, uh, an extraordinary amount of, of short-term loans come due. So uh, you can look up some of the charts out there, but we have over $8 billion in loan maturity October, November. So literally right now, as of this recording, October, November, 2023, there's over $8 billion in loan maturities, and it's all these short-term loans, bridge debt, uh, if you watch the, the graphs, there was a large spike in purchasing right after COVID, right after the lockdown. We come out of lockdown. Everybody's flush with capital, um, stimulus money. The world's just a wash in cash. We come out of lockdown. There was a big spike in purchasing. But the problem was, was 90% of that debt were the short-term two-year IO adjustable rate, interest only for, for those listeners, interest only and adjustable rate loans. Well, that was a good idea until it wasn't, right? So as soon as the Fed started raising the rates, their loans started uh, adjusting and their interest rates went up if they had a rate cap. See, now when you have an adjustable rate mortgage, you can get a little insurance policy called a rate cap and uh, it'll stop the rate from, from going up on you. Yes, but once the loan comes due, you still have to exit and that's where the market uh, is, is you're, you're being kicked out into the market. So we had a lot of people that went out and got two-year loans even if their interest rate wasn't necessarily adjustable, the loan is matured and now they have to pay this loan off. And if they want to refinance, they're going from, you know, three and a half, maybe 4% interest rate into these seven and a half, eight percent interest rate loans. And in there, right there is where you're going to see a tremendous amount of stress and uh, distress in the market because these loans to recapitalize, uh, you're going to have a capital call. You're going to have a lot of money being put into that deal where I know a lot of sellers uh, or, or investors were planning on doing the bar model, the buy, renovate, refinance, and pull money out. They were not planning on buying, renovating, refinancing, and writing a check at, at that point in time. And that's what we're going to see to bring that equity correct. And I don't think a lot of people can write that check. And I think that's where we're going to see some distress. But I think you're going to see a tremendous amount of opportunity for buyers and, and people who have positioned themselves uh, in the next cycle. So that's what I think is about to happen. I agree, Bill. There's so much in your head. It's hard for me to kind of, uh, I guess, piece, piece, piece by piece, take it out for my listeners. But uh, so this goes back to what you said originally. You have to understand how you're analyzing deals because all these deals are coming to you know to market. They're they're going to be listing deals. You're going to find more deals, but you don't if you don't know what you're looking at, you don't know what you're getting into. So it's really important that you do understand analyzing deals, and you can't just expect today to jump into the multifamily game and have like a few hours of underwriting practice and and know how to know what a good deal is, right? So um, it and takes time. Down three simple steps. There's only three things you need to know in this business. If you hit one of them, it's deal flow, deal analysis, networking. So if we're getting complicated here, let's bring it back simple. Those are the only three things you have to have to be successful in real estate. You got to have deal flow. You got to have deals coming in the door on a regular basis. You got to know what you're looking at. 
You got to know what a good deal is, deal analysis, and that's what you're mentioning. And then you have to have the the net work and the net worth in order to take the deals down to so the relationships. So it's deal flow, deal analysis, and networking, and, and that's it. Love it, man. And you had recently, uh, actually yesterday, I got it. It was so funny, man. I, I was, I was, I wanted to talk to you for so long, and then all of a sudden we got this finally booked. And then last night I got an email from you that you have a new multifamily analyzer tool, and I. I watched the video of it and it is phenomenal. I just kind of want to. Yeah, it's it's been in the creation for for a while. It's my new Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, I want. Can you talk about it a little bit? Absolutely, yeah, I'd love to. Um, yeah, so it's a brand new uh, deal analyzer template called the Ultimate uh, Analyzer, and it is available on my website, realestateraw.com. Uh, you can go there and download it. It's. Uh, but at any rate, um, yeah. So so I've been in the business twenty years. And I've been teaching for uh, over a decade, I think it's about 12, 13 years now. And so what I finally wanted to do was to create a deal, an analyzer template that served two purposes. One was very easy and simple for the, the person to use. Two was something that I could teach people from. And, and so I wanted to use it as my own coaching program as an education tool, but at the same time, have something that's that's very simple and easy to use. So with my 20 years of experience as an owner operator, plus a teacher, I really sat down and said, all right, what is a what does a person need to know and in what order and in what format? So that's what we created the template to be a, a almost a funnel. Like you can't mess it up, right? It, it, it walks you through the deal analysis process step by step. I've broken it down into tabs. So you just follow the tab and you know, that's all you have to do. And, and I've locked everything. So it only has spaces to fill the data out. So you can't mess anything up. You can't screw it up. Um, and it literally will will hold your hand and walk you through the deal analysis process. If you'll just fill the info out, it'll it'll do everything for you. Um, you can go a real long version uh, or you can do a very short version. So short version, I'm telling people that you should be under 10 minutes analyzing a deal uh, and getting full full info. If you're doing a long version, you're, you're spending more than 10 minutes. Uh, and that in there, I have embedded a bunch of calculators. Right. So you can do a real sort of quick back of the napkin. Or if you're one of these data driven people and you really want to get in there and craft out all the different numbers. And, you know, uh, we've got a CapEx uh, exploded CapEx calculator. You can go in there and enter in countertops and cabinets and paying carb. You know, if that's what you want to do, we have it in there. Right. If you want to do fast, you can analyze the deal quickly. So we have it either way where you can really build out a very, uh, very extrapolated, exploded version of um, a performa. Or you can just just you know chop deals down quick and move on to the next one. So I use it and I tell everybody to use it fast to decide if you want to go long, right? So just use the fast version, quick analysis. Hey, is this thing even close? If it's close, eh, then go back and spend a little more time. But uh, yeah, that's what I designed it for with the student slash professional in mind and also to be a good teaching tool. It's awesome, man. Uh, there's a lot of different aspects to it that I, well, first of all, the layout itself is very clean, very well done. And, uh, there's a lot of aspects that we can use as analyzers when we're analyzing deals. I mean, the, you, you have a syndication piece to it, right? You can, there's a breakout for each partner and how much the equity buckets are worth. And you can even adjust those and it's very well thought out, man. I Thank like you. it. Yeah, that's I, what I did was I went through and I said, okay, what are the questions that I get asked when I'm teaching analysis, syndication, partnership structuring, equity splits, you know, and I just said all the questions I've ever been asked, let's just put those answers somewhere in here in this template, you know, because you're going to ask, which means you need to know. So yeah, people have always asked me, well, how, you know, if we're going to do this general partner thing, I'm going to give some money to the investors and partners and I are going to keep some of the deal. How do I split that up? Like first question, how do I know how much to keep? Do I keep 30? Is it 20? Is it, you know, how much do we keep? Second, what do we do with it? There's four of us as partners. Who, who gets what? And that's what we've created that template in there, the bucket system that allow you to go ahead and uh, schedule your equity splits with your investors. So super simple. Uh, again, I just kind of took everything in my head over the last 20 years and put it into a template. Yeah, well, so I tried to do the same thing, but it didn't come out as pretty. Now, there's also another piece to it that I really like, which is, um, and I attempted to incorporate this as well, it's just a, a way of calculating taxes. So taxes are a big thing when we're analyzing deals and, and you have a variety of ways because different markets calculate them differently. Different counties are different. So I don't know, that part is really cool too. Little tax calculator, that was one of the the um, inventions that, that we really like in there that uh, the people that we created, uh, was a bit, bit of their idea. But yeah, that's the ca tax calculator allows you to quickly select which, however, your county 
uh, does taxes. You can do a percent of the revenue. You can calculate taxes on a percentage of the property value. You can go in and choose a millage rate. And it sounds complicated, but I assure you it's not. You just go in and select your menu. And then the, the template does that tax calculation for you. So all you have to do is know how your county calculates. Is it mill rate or income or whatever the case? Plug the number in, boom, done for you. Yes. So I love it, man. So, uh, and where could they get that? Uh, yeah, again, it's realestateraw.com. The whole thing is uh, at real estate. Just scroll down. When you first land on the page, just scroll down a little bit. It's about midway down on the page. Um, just click on the link and you can, you can get it right there. It's $197 uh, on the real estate raw uh, website. It also comes with an instructional video. So uh, if you download it off the website, it comes with about a 20 minute video of me uh, on Zoom putting the template up, giving you a, a walkthrough. So it has instructions, written instructions embedded in it. But again, it comes with a, an instructional video. So uh, it's about 20 minutes of me. I'm just showing you all the bells and whistles and walking you through it. Wonderful, Bill. All right. So now people are people are analyzing deals. Uh, they they Maybe they chose their market. Uh, you have spoken about this in the past and I've found it to be almost exactly accurate. With It's like the rule of 80 or something like that. You, are, you have to right. underwrite yeah, a certain amount of deals. So let's hear about it. Yeah, well, that number might be a lot these days. So um, typically what I tell everybody is that you're going to analyze about 80 deals or so to find a good deal, right? And so it's it's not a law. It's just kind of a generalization that has been a, a truism in my world that, you know, you're going to go through, maybe, maybe these days the market's a little cool, you'll hit 100, you know, you're going to go through on average, you know, 80 to 100 deal an analyses to get one that's actually going to hit, right? And so when I say deal analyzing or analysis, I'm not talking about all the way going out and property tour and walking the units and all that. I'm talking about deals that hit your desk, you do some version of analysis of, you know, you're, you're going to look at it, get the numbers, crunch it, yes or no. You're going to run through about 80 of those to 100 to really get one to hit. You'll probably find 20, 25 or so that are pretty good. You're like, hey, those are close, I like the numbers. Of those, you're going to get maybe 10 or 12 offers submitted, right? Of the 10 or 12 offers, you're going to get a handful of them that, that might get accepted. Uh, you know, two are going to go to highest and best. You'll probably lose in the highest and best round. Um, one of them, your attorney is going to over-negotiate and kill, right? I promise. The other one, the other attorney is going to over-negotiate and kill because attorneys love killing deals, right? Maybe you find something wrong with one of them in due diligence. You know, you're going to find something you don't like that you didn't realize. And that last one is going to be the one that, that pretty much makes it through. So that's just a generalization of sort of a deal funnel, if you want to call it that, that starts off um, broad-based with your deal flow. We talked about that deal flow, deal analysis. So yeah, you're bringing in those hundred. You're now using your analysis skills plus the template. You're, you're bringing it down. You're getting them down to the ones that are like, you know, second, third look worthy, then property tour worthy, then offer worthy. And then you just, you go on down the line. And yeah, about about one at 80 or so is, is what we're finding uh, to, to get a good deal. I love it, man. Um, okay. But it goes back to also your point. If you have to be analyzing deals, you have to know what you're looking at. So you got it. So people, I don't, Everybody that I talked to, and me myself included, when I first began my journey, I was like, I'm going to get into this deal. I'm going to be the one to buy this building and I'm going to become rich. And it's not necessarily that way because you're competing against a lot of people, first of all, and you don't know what you're getting into and you're giving away a lot of equity if you don't have anything to give. So, I mean, what are you bringing to the table there? So it takes time in this business to really kind of to get your, your juices flowing. And you have this theory of like the conveyor belt, which I always tell people about, because I think it's a really good analogy. And maybe you can kind of talk about the conveyor. Absolutely. belt. It's, it's the basis for the logo in real estate raw. And that's why I have the conveyor belt behind me in this logo. And so, um, yeah, it's a concept that I've created to sort of quickly uh, convey the concept of how real estate actually works and how you can go out and, and create a real business and do it pretty quickly. So um, I always kind of start off, ask people, you know, listen, how much money do you need to make uh, in cash flow? What's your number a month? 99% of the time, it's about 10 grand a month or in, you know, a multiple of 10, maybe 20 or 30, whatever. So let's just start the conversation with $10,000 a month. You need $10,000 a month, net, net positive cash flow. All right. Well, where does cash flow come from? Well, it comes from either equity or control of a building, not just from thin air. So we will say equity. We got to we got to get deals. We got to get equity. All right. Then let's do some math. A million and a half dollars producing an eight percent cash on cash return, which is sort of normal. But a million and a half dollars at an eight percent return is one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. 
divide by 12, there's your 10 grand a month. So if you want $10,000 a month passive revenue, it's easy. Just invest a million and a half dollars at 8%. Boom, you're all good. Okay. If you don't have a million and a half dollars to just haul off and invest at 8%, then cash flow is not your agenda. And there's where everybody's going wrong. They're out here trying to build cash flow, but you don't have the equity that produces the cash flow. So you're getting this chicken and egg scenario going on. And that's why I created the conveyor belt theory was to show you where you start and where this progresses to. So yes, we want to get cash flow, absolutely. But you, it's the equity that goes to work, right? And you were kind of noticing this early on when you first start off in a business, you don't have that million and a half bucks. You don't have that tremendous amount of equity. So we need to go get the equity so that the money goes to work and we stop getting off the couch and going to work, right? And that's why we are, our, our goal now is to create a million and a half bucks, not cash flow. You're not going to cash flow a million and a half bucks. That then in turn creates a million and a half bucks worth of cash. That's how that works, right? So we now need this million and a half bucks. How are we going to get it? All right, that's the conveyor belt. So again, just imagine a conveyor belt like the one behind me in the logo here, any normal conveyor belt in a, you know, in a factory or something. We're going to use this analogy and say the conveyor belt is five years long. All right. And I'm, I'm using this number five years because that is the typical hold time for a multifamily you know, property. Yeah. Over the last couple of years, it's been a lot shorter. We've seen people doing two, three years, stuff like that, but traditionally five years. So, you know, imagine the conveyor belt in year number one, you're going to put your first property on the conveyor belt. All right. That's our first closing. Probably going to be a smaller property. You know, maybe like me, it was a duplex, right? It wasn't a big giant property, smaller property. Maybe you're doing some multifamily houses, whatever. Put that property on there. Now, as it's moving along this conveyor belt, that's time. And it's also representing our, our portfolio, our hold period. So as the property's moving along the conveyor belt left to right, it's cash flowing. You're operating. Okay, here comes year number two. Year number two, now you've put your second property on the conveyor belt. Now I've got two of them going along. Okay, year number three, you're putting your third property on the conveyor belt. Okay, now maybe we get a little bit bigger. Now we're probably talking small multifamily. You're starting to get some equity going. You're getting your business going. Okay, year number four. Here we go. Now you're getting you're getting us a bigger property. Year number five, you're full swing. You're syndicating. You've got really some multifamily on the conveyor belt now. Okay, so at the end of year five or year five, that very first property that we put over here on the conveyor belt is now coming off the end of the conveyor belt, right? It's reached the end of, of the length. That coming off of the conveyor belt represents a liquidity event that can be a sale, a refinance, whatever the case. It's the realization of the equity, right? So hopefully as this thing's moving along the conveyor belt, one, it's cash flowing, two, it's appreciating, all right? Comes off the end of the conveyor belt, liquidity event, cash money, there's your equity. You're going to take that, roll it back around to the other side, the front of the conveyor belt, and add that to the next purchase, like a 1031 exchange or something like that, right? And so the idea here is as you're putting these assets on the conveyor belt, once you get into some, some decent-sized multifamily, you're probably generating revenue right there. You're probably getting an act fee, an acquisition fee, you know, things um, created from putting the asset onto the conveyor belt. You're now managing it. So you're, you're asset managing, you're cash flowing, you're operating as it moves along the conveyor belt, comes off the end of the conveyor belt liquidity event, Take that money, move it back around to the front. And the idea is that now you want to run this conveyor belt year over year over year. And over time, the smaller properties, the first ones you bought, they're going to come off. You're always upgrading the conveyor belt. You're always upgrading the portfolio. And the reason that I kind of created this was, was to show several different concepts. One, um, that the answer is not hold forever, right? People ask me that question all the time. Well, hey, if I've got a good deal, why would I ever sell it? I mean, if this property is cash flowing and it makes money, wouldn't I just want to hold that thing forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? Well, yeah, okay, hold on. First off, real estate gets old. In properties age and you have capital expense idea things and plumbing and roofs and all that. So you got to kind of time some of that stuff. You can't just say, well, I'm going to hold a real estate building for the next 100 years. That's not going to work, right? So first off, you want to kind of time that. Second off, you sell when the markets are up and you can realize years of cash flow all in one transaction. That's another reason that you sell is because you get a big lump sum and you time the market, market cycle. It's different, but that's the idea there. And then again, to show you that this, if you'll run the conveyor belt, it's those liquidity events that create that million and a half that rolls around. That's this, this conveyor belt becomes your net worth. 
And that's where you start getting that cash flow that you're actually looking for. It's not going to come in day one. And that's what Nico's pointing out here is like, hey, jumped in, thought we're going to you know, get rich day one. Yeah, that's not real estate. It takes a few years in this, this conveyor belt running. You're building your credibility. You're building your relationships. You're building your skill set, your information, your knowledge, right? That's what a real real estate business looks like. Second reason I created this, legacy wealth. It's another big concept that I run into a lot when teaching real estate. People have this concept of legacy wealth. Great idea. Everybody wants to leave something for the kids, the grandkids, all this kind of stuff. Fine. But, but people misunderstand legacy wealth and they say, oh, well, I'm going to buy a bunch of apartments and leave the grandkids a bunch of apartments. No, you're not. You're going to make your grandkids slumlords. <laughs> right? Those properties are going to be rotten. They're going to have sawdust by the time you give them to your grandkids. That's crazy. Don't leave them old buildings. Leave them the conveyor belt right? Leave them the business. That's the key, not, not the assets. You know, I've, I've bought so many properties from people that said, oh, you know, such and such passed away and left me this place. Just take it. Just, just write me a check. I don't want the property. I don't want the money. So by the way, finding legacy properties is one of the best places to get good deals. So if anybody's <laughs> inherited real estate, call that owner because uh, they're probably going to sell it as soon as grandpa's not around and they'll sell it cheap. <laughs> oh man. Information, not, not real estate. You're the, you're the best, Bill. It's, it's so you have so much knowledge, so much um, just education and, and information inside of you. It's just wonderful to talk to. You. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you some more personal type of a qu questions. Um, have are you still doing deals personally in this market? I am looking at deals currently right now. Yes, um, I have not closed one recently, but then again. Not that many people have closed a deal. Uh, currently, deal volume nationally is down around 75%. I believe it is. Uh, last time I looked, 70, 75%. So 75% um, of the world basically has not done a deal recently. And I fall into that category. Um, I am not on the sidelines. I'm not passive. I'm absolutely in the business. I'm absolutely looking at deals. I know what a good deal is. Um, they're just not always getting my offers accepted. So, you know, there, there it is. But uh, yeah, I'm very active, very much looking at deals. Are you still working with Tony? Yeah, yeah, Tony Morgan. Yeah, very good friend and partner. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Broadwell Property Group. Yeah, he's a solid guy. Okay. Yeah, I like Tony. And you st you mentioned earlier that you're still looking at Atlanta, and you're but you're living in Clearwater in Florida. Are you, are you not looking at anything in Florida? I am not personally looking in Florida. You know, and I and I I, I hate kind of saying that out loud because I'm certainly not suggesting other people don't look in Florida. Um, I am just not personally looking in Florida. My concern with Florida is the insurance market. You know, that's the big elephant in the room. Um, my concern, I love Florida. It's not that. It's just that the insurance market has not stabilized in its pricing. Therefore, committing to a perform or a business model is difficult in Florida right now because you just don't know where your operational expenses are going to go. You know, if they keep just raising the interest rates up or, or you know, leaving the, the industry altogether, as we've seen a lot of carriers leave this market, um, that makes your cost of operation a variable and that increases the risk factor. So I don't mind buying in Florida if I can bring the price down due to the new risk factor and bring the price down is not something we've seen occur yet. So that's yeah. my answer to Florida. Very, very well said, man. So we had a 40% increase uh, from last year and I modeled in a 25% increase for next year, whether it happens or not, whatever, but that's how I'm modeling it. And that's my argument with brokers right now. And it's like, you, it's, do it. you know what it's, you mentioned that earlier. So people, people's loans are coming due and whether or not they can refi is one thing, but the expenses have also changed aside from the, from the interest rates. So now they're getting hit with the higher expenses and, and vacancy, there's more vacancy. So we've experienced the, the recession or the pending recession is kind of happening in a way. And some of the people, you know, if specifically I'm talking about one bed units, the one bedroom units, people can't afford it on a single income, but a two bedroom unit, two people can buddy up. And you've mentioned this in the past as well. People will tend to buddy up together in a recession and our two beds, hundred percent occupied. Our one beds are not. And we're considering section eight on those because section eight is actually paying pretty decent, uh, close to market rate. So that's where we're I've at. always kind of warned people one bedrooms in sort of a, a cooling off economy. They don't offer a lot of um, options for renters, you know, or at least I will say they have less, uh, less options. 
Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Okay. So now in the, what are you, what are you thinking about the future, man? I don't want to have you predict any interest rate stuff, but are you excited for what's going on? Are you still? Sure. Interested? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I am. I have to admit I've been a little bearish over the last two years where everybody else has been really excited about the market. I've not, I've been a little cooled off on the market the last couple of years, but now, um, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go now. It's, it's fixing to be party time here real soon. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very excited. I think we're going to see a, a, a cooling off. I, I, I don't think we're going to see a full crash or anything like that. I think some properties are going to see experience some devaluation. Some areas will will see some downturn. I don't believe America is about to, you know, have some kind of massive real estate crash or anything of that nature. Um, but I think there are going to be some shifts, and there there will be some money made and some money lost, as there always is in a transition cycle. But um, you know, stay tuned. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Okay, I want to. Uh, I got to sign off, but I wanted to ask you something, just kind of for some fun. Um, you know, people, I I know this because I was in the, the my listeners' shoes as well, where I get so excited about seller financing, has or or even master lease options. Has there ever been a scenario where at the end of the contract that you had created with the seller, uh, where that did they didn't want to sell, or did something like that ever happen to you? Yes. Yes and no. Okay. It's not ever happened to me personally. I have gotten to the end of a master lease option where I chose not to exercise the option, which was fully part of the agreement. Um, I forfeited the deposit, the, the earned the option money and said, you know, I really don't feel like buying the property. It was a great test drive. I had actually operated the property up to, to uh, full condition. So the seller was able to actually sell it and got a great price. It just wasn't to me. It just wasn't in the market at the time. Um, I have had a friend, a very, very close friend. So it did not occur to me, but I got a front row seat for a seller that did exactly what you're talking about. That that the uh, my very good friend brought the value of the property up, and uh, when the when the seller realized the new value of the property, decided to not honor the agreement to transfer the title at the end of the lease option. And uh, and yes, my my friend had to um, lawyer up you know, and go in there and deal with it and litigate. And that was uh, uncomfortable. That is the risk of a master lease option. You're a renter, not an owner. And so I always recommend if you can do seller financing, do seller financing first, where you get a clean transfer of title. If not, then then do the lease option. Um, the the catch, and I'll, I'll kind of bring this back for everybody here. The catch is my friend put down too much money, right? He put, he didn't use my formula uh, that, I, that I talk about in my book on how to put down a certain amount of money so that you always recover that prior to the end of the deal. He didn't follow that system. And he wound up getting to the end of that uh, agreement with a, over a million dollars of investor money, sort of as option money. So he he got into a situation where he really couldn't just walk away. So if you follow my system that I talk about in Creative Cash, you'll get to the end of a lease option and you'll have, you'll have options. You'll have a choice to either close or not close. If you don't follow that system, you may wind up like my friend where you have a bunch of money tied up that wasn't his. He had no choice but to uh, but to sue. Jeez, man. Well, so it's. It, I think all this is fun and exciting. I love this. I love the business. I'm going to be in it forever. Uh, but I love that you shared that information with people who are kind of fresh and new and maybe they. it's just something to think about. So thanks, Bill. All right, let's wrap it up. I'm, I'm going to uh, ask my last question and then I'm going to have you uh, give the listeners some form of contacting you or finding you or your books or your resources. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Bill, let's imagine it was 100 years from now. You have heirs, you have people that are around you, surrounding you, living on, and they wanted to write books about you. What would you want them to title this book? It, they, the book would probably have to be titled something like, How Did We Get Here? <laughs> having kids. So I'm kind of wondering like how they're going to write this book. So they're, they're probably going to have to write like, how the heck did we get here? That would be a great <laughs> title for that book because, because they don't exist. Right. But let's just assume magically they did just for the fun of the answer. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, Bill, Bill, the, Bill, the teacher, Bill, the educator. I think I would, uh, at the end of my life, I'd probably more want to be more remembered for my teaching than for my business. Uh, and for my writing and for, for the education that I've shared with the world. So I would hope the book would be something like, you know, build a teacher, something to that effect. But again, I'm wondering how they're writing this book, seeing as how uh, they're not going to exist. But I love it, man. Hey, you are an, a superb teacher. Every And I'm going to say this out loud for everybody here. Everybody that I talk to in whatever community has nothing but good things to say about you. Well, thank the, you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's very true. They everybody values your opinion, your word, and your experience, and you are highly, highly uh, sought after as a coach and as a teacher. So thank you, Bill. Thank you.
very much. Thanks for having me on again. It's been great. Second time around. Let's do it again. I can't wait, man. I know you're busy, but all right, let's get the listeners some form of contact to you. Absolutely. Uh, so easy, the two books, Creative Cash, Real Estate Raw, they're on Amazon, super simple. Um, and then my website is the logo behind me is realestateraw.com. Um, I offer all of my services on Real Estate Raw. So anything you need, you can go there. Um, I have a coaching program. So if you want some information on that, everything is there. Um, the template is there, anything. And I have a tremendous amount of articles, free resources, uh, I think I'm up to like 68 different articles that I wrote on the blog on Real Estate Raw. So if you need a bunch of uh, good sort of bite-sized information, tremendous amount of information there. Um, email, Bill at Go Broadwell. F feel free to email me, contact me, ask me any questions you have. It's B-I-L-L -L at Go Broadwell, G-O-B-R-O-A-D-W-E-L-L. -L. Uh, and I'm on all the, the major social medias. If you're looking for me online, just type in Bill Ham Real Estate you will pull up almost everything that I've ever done online. So just Google Bill Ham Real Estate. You'll find me. Awesome. Yes, Bill, it has been a pleasure talking with you again. I can't wait to do it again soon. Absolutely. I'm going to check good, out. Good to, good to speak with you. Yeah, I'm going to get your calculator. I'm going to rip off and duplicate some aspects of Please it. Do. But I honor and and cherish, you know, all of no our problem. conversations. Hey, I, I got some ideas from some other templates. I will not tell. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. All right. Take care. All right. Hey, Small Axe community. I would like to say thank you for listening to another episode of my podcast, where we show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. Now, if you liked what you heard, it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe, leave a five-star rating, and write a review. Also, if you want to get in touch with me, go to my website at smallaxecommunities.com. Book a call with me. And until the next episode, keep sharpening those axes.